Global leaders are in China for the Boao Economic Forum as the world looks to China to drive economic growth. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. The Boao Economic Forum started in 2001 as a way to discuss the global economy. This year is the first since 2020 where the forum is in person. Chinese Premier Li Chung is calling on governments around the world to work together to energize global growth. Li also called for more cooperation and support for global security initiatives. Sen Juen reports. The chairman of the Pua Forum for Asia, Ban Ki-moon, says the clock is ticking faster than expected as the world faces a food and energy crisis and is trapped in an ongoing crisis between Russia and Ukraine. We do not have much time left. Clocks are ticking on multiple fronts. Loudest of all is the climate clock. Food and energy crisis following the conflict in Ukraine dealt with another heavy blow to those struggling to make ends meet. In his keynote address to the Boa Forum gathering on Thursday, China's new Premier Li Chang said the world is looking for certainty in growth and wants to proceed on the path of pursuing a better future. He said China does not seek to take over or colonize others to realize its goals. We we need to implement the GSI, uphold the vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security, oppose one-time use of unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction, reject taking sides, block confrontation and new Cold War, and address differences and disputes through peaceful means to jointly uphold world peace and tranquility. More than 2,000 delegates from over 50 countries and regions have gathered for the forum's annual conference in Hainan province this year. Among them are representatives of governments, business and entrepreneurs. Premier Li says 60 percent of the world's population lives in Asia and the continent accounts for 40 percent of global economy. He called on political and business leaders to inject new energy into global governance and to work to achieve high-quality development and collaboration through the Belt and Road Initiative. Working together to build a more vibrant center of growth to bring greater certainty to world economic recovery. Asia, with nearly 60 percent of the world's population, almost 40 percent of the global economy and over 30 percent of international trade, is an anchor and propeller of global growth and a source of impetus of global economy. Premier Li says China will continue in its role as a major responsible nation, sharing its wisdom with the world. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong echoed the Chinese Premier's remarks. He said challenges should not erode economic cooperation and connectivity between China, Asia and the world. Officials and experts at the forum say the world has looked to China and Asia to play constructive roles as catalysts for growth. The goal can be met only if the world comes together in pursuing globalization and multilateralism. Chinese officials say they will continue to advance the global development initiative proposed by Chinese President Xi Jinping and to foster growth in the spirit of solidarity and cooperation. Chen Ziyuan, CGTN, Hua, Hainan Province. We have a lot to discuss. Let's get right into our panelists. Two of them are attending the forum in Boao. Yu Hao Wang is founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Hong Chin is a partner in Oliver Wyman's Financial Services. Here in the United States, Remy Piet is a senior partner at Embley Advisory, joining us from Miami. And here in Washington, D.C., Sarup Gupta is senior Asia-Pacific international relations policy specialist at the Institute for China-American Studies. Welcome to the broadcast, uh, gentlemen. Hu Yao Wang, why don't I start with you? You're there. A lot of people compare this to uh, the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. They call it Davos of Asia. Uh, describe for us the growing importance of the Boao Forum and how it's just kind of de developed over these years. 
Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mike. I think this is uh, really uh, very impressive. I was there, you know, I, I just got back. But uh, but what I, I felt is that uh, this ball form has been uh, uh, very, uh, you know, lively now. And, uh, you know, uh, really face-to-face -face meetings and uh, gathering of 2,000 people since pandemic. In, uh, I use Ban Ki-moon's word, you know, four years' time, they haven't really seen each other face-to-face. -face. So. So this is really, I think, inject enormous uh, uh, confidence, and also it's calling for, or, you know, more uh, multinationals, uh, foreign uh, uh, guests, and uh, a visit to come to China. So this is a great symbolize. I mean, I attended the China Development Forum, and now at a Boal Forum, I found that uh, there's there's a quite a strong optimism and actually uh, confidence being come uh, built up for to see what has been, uh, you know, very impressively. China for the last two months also very, very impressively economic growth. But I think more so is there's a parade of uh, global leaders coming. At broad form, we had, uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, Prime Minister Li Xianlong, but also had the, uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister of Spain, we have the uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of Malaysia, we have the IMF head, we have the uh, uh, President, uh, Prime Minister from Africa. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of leaders coming too. But, but again, we will see more coming to China, Macron is coming uh, in a few days' time, and uh, with European president. So you see this uh, not only coming back with the business, but also coming back with all those uh, 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 global leaders. So that shows that China is, is opened up. It sent a strong signal to the world that China is welcoming everyone, and China would like to work with everyone to really revitalize and boost the global economy and give certainty. You know, as the uh, Bo Form said, it's a lot of uncertainty. Let's let's inject some certainty and inject some really uh, a positive uh, uh, impetus into this uh, global economy, but also, I think, give the people more, uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence in, in this uh, economy. And also, people are seeing how China is doing, now seeing, believing, and everything functioning pretty well in China. That's, a, that's really a, a, a very good thing for people come to know uh, in, in, uh, in, you know, in the first personal experience. That's really, uh, I think, China really send a, a series of signals that uh, China opened up again, and China is welcoming everybody. Uh, Hong Shin, I want to get your impressions as well. Uh, he, he comes away very optimistic. It's as if the China is opening up its arms to the world and saying, we're ready to embrace you. Yes, absolutely. So um, in Boa, we actually feel a strong infusion of energy across the region, and also especially from China. And uh, at, at, just that being said, uh, in Boa, Boa started like uh, 20 years ago or more than 20 years ago. And at the time, the conception of Boa basically uh, is from the Asia financial crisis. And, we, and then the Asian countries wants to create something together for Asia, modeled uh, after that was, as you mentioned. But in the end, like uh, when uh, after all the pandemic, after all the uh, challenges over the past three years, we finally get together. We finally uh, together discussing uh, key topics for the region, key topics for the world. And increasingly, what's important for the region is also important for the world. So definitely, Boa is getting it, its status. And additionally, through this time, we actually see that uh, when a lot of the gen uh, when a lot of the journalists, when a lot of the representatives from the world actually comes over, not only in the region but across the world, comes over to see what's the recent development in China, what's the uh, atmosphere or the confidence in China, in Hainan specifically, it shows a great resilience of the economy. It shows a great uh, recovery at, 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 at its very beginning. Uh, Sir Gupta, uh, Hainan, obviously a beautiful locale to have any kind of meeting, and uh, we're hearing a lot of optimism from our two uh, guests that we've just spoken to. But uh, we do have to mention that the Singapore Prime Minister, you know, one of the many leaders in Asia, calling on a cooling off in these frictions between the United States and China because it does have a ripple effect, a spillover effect. It can impact other Asian countries in the neighborhood. In fact, he, he went on to say he wants to see stabilization in ties because the clash could have grievous consequences, not just for these two countries, for the entire world. So there is optimism there, but there's also a level of concern. Can you talk about it? Oh, yes, absolutely. And particularly at a time when the conflict in, in Europe still continues in, in Ukraine, uh, one cannot discount that these sort, that these sort of matters could also at some point of time and they come to come to Asia. That would be very unfortunate. 
you know, the European security architecture has collapsed in the name of 40,000, for, for, I mean, 40 million Ukrainians. Uh, we don't want the Asian security architecture to collapse in the name of 23 million Taiwanese. And so, obviously, one cannot discount these fears. And this is a difficult moment that we are living in. Even from an economic standpoint, if one looks, you know, last year, the RCEP, RCEP has the regional comprehensive economic agreement on, on trade came into being. And con some countries are even moving, have moved forward on the CPTPP. China is trying to accede to that. But we also have to remember, at the same time, we have the IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework negotiations happening. And that is happening without China. And the US is trying to lead its blo a, a, a block out there. And of course, we know about many of the supply chain and, and supposedly in the name of resilience, the export controls and, and the, and the block-based formations on much of strategic trade. So all this is in front of us. It's not going away. And while we do have, at least I would say in the short and hopefully in the medium term, Asia being the growth center for the world, and it has been for a while, but um, but 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 continuing to be, uh, we cannot discount these larger factors which could collapse growth if they ever went out of control. And should, by the way, we shouldn't in all this conversation we shouldn't be forgetting about the Korean Peninsula. I mean that is edging closer to a nuclear conflict perhaps at some point of time. So this is important to maintain the be aware of this in the background even as we look forward with hope and anticipation and expectation in 2023. Remy Piet, I saw you nodding your head. I want you to give a chance uh, to jump in here. Uh, your thoughts. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I completely second some of the comments that were made just, just before on the importance of this summit. It's uh, important uh, in, in terms of, of China being able to showcase the openness of its uh, of its country and its return more on, on, on world discussions after after the pandemics. We've seen some already uh, strong uh, engagements and on, on the question of peace with uh, you know brokering agreements between Saudi Arabia and Iran while there are other engagements in uh, internationally and and the Bawai uh, forum uh, really is an opportunity to do the same thing on, on the economic front it's a very important forum because it's actually gathers a series of of actors that might be on the other side you know of, of, of uh, other summits such as BRICS for example or or G7 here you're having Japan talking to China you're having more allies of the of the US being able to talk to different uh, actors and so the the position from from Singapore was you know mainly to just mention that it's important to keep those those uh, those uh, arenas where we can actually discuss about globalization effects, about issues about energy transition, about access to critical resources, for example. All those issues were discussed, and it's actually a good a, a good uh, uh, progress of, of being able to relaunch conversation between a series of very important economies on those questions of, of, of global magnitude. So in that case, you know, definitely Li Xiang made a very good uh, you know uh, opening address that were well well received in terms of, of uh, convincing the fact that China should be able to meet its objective in terms of, of growth, and that actually followed up with a series of, of conversation of, of, uh, from, from Malaysia calling for additional you know, boost of the Belt and Road Initiative. And then some thematic conversations are very interesting to listen to in terms of, as I was saying, energy transition, the place of hydrogen, the place of other you know, uh, um, uh, solar energies and, and, and technologies with the relation with Europe and potentially decreasing its trade barriers, mm -hmm. but also on the case of critical minerals with a series of interventions of how to be able to successfully uh, you know, uh, have sustainable supply chains in terms of, of battery vehicles and other modes of transportation. Uh, Hu Yan Wong, obviously uh, covering a lot of ground. We were just talking about that. And, and I want to go back to one of your earlier points where you're talking about uh, emerging from the COVID lockdowns. What can you tell us about this recovery process and what's happening with the supply chains? Because we know during the pandemic, everybody was saying they were loused up. Have we seen improvement there? Well, I think we, we see a huge improvement, uh, actually. Uh, you know, actually in China now, there are many measures has been taken to res re resume. For example, China has, uh, uh, you know, uh, stopped the COVID test uh, to come to China. China has resumed uh, many international flights. And China has actually, you know, welcomed all the foreign <laughs> but, uh, performers and, and artists group to come. And also, of course, uh, you know, the uh, since the uh, the two sections, actually, the, the all the provincial has launched a, 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 a campaign of improving the environment uh, for business uh, operating in China. I mean, Jack Ma is back, and uh, you know, <laughs> Alibaba is divided into six big groups. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, a response from business community as well, and multinational. At, at the China Development Forum, there's over 70 global CEO come. 
So as you see, there's a, there's a lot of plans, there's a lot of delayed investment, there's a lot of delayed decisions, and now really rushed back and, and restarted uh, again in China. And of course, uh, you know, just for the last two months, it's a figure. Uh, uh, as Li Chang uh, Premier said uh, uh, yesterday at the board of opening forum, I was there, you know, listening that. It's, it's basically saying, look, I mean, the two months performance is out of expectation. And the March number, he said, and the March number are probably even better. So, so that's give a huge, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, confidence and uh, shows that uh, uh, things are really working. And so all the, uh, from top down, that's, that's the beauty of China, top down and uh, very efficient, very effective. The chain of command is, they look, let's, you know, improve the environment, let's enhance the performance. I think, but we have to be also uh, cautious a bit, though, is that, we, you know, what, what are the, we need to adjust our models, of course, we have to stimulate the uh, consumptions, we have to probably, uh, can, you know, diversify the uh, economy, and also we have to, uh, you know, re-inject, really, uh, you know, uh, get less savings, more spendings, and changing some habits, and uh, so there's many things has to be done, but, but, but more than that, I think now, China is, uh, is really ready. Uh, 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 all the new momentum is back. And everybody, I was just out of the Be Be Beijing <laughs> International Airport last night at midnight. It's, it's jet packed. There's so many people, uh, traffic, and uh, it's so, so busy now. I mean, that's a good sign to see people are really back and people are really geared up to, uh, to, to make a, a surely going to surpass 5% this year. Could be 6, 7%. So I think China, as, as the you know, consensus is there, China can provide stability to the Asian economy and ASEAN's largest trading partner with China, and Asia can provide stability for the world. So this uh, China, Asia, and the global economy are, are intertwined, and we cannot decouple. We have to work together. Yeah, Sir Gutti, uh, just listening to that, uh, I, I imagine a lot of people who are in the tourism business love hearing that Beijing's airport's uh, packed with people. And you start thinking about the economic ripple effects, and clearly uh, they're out there. In fact, uh, the IMF managing director just talked about recently about a 1% uh, increase in GDP in China and how it can actually lift up the economies in Asia. Can you talk about that ripple effect and how uh, neighboring countries can also benefit if China does uh, improve its GDP as much as he's talking about, I mean, a lot of projections, 5%, perhaps even higher. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I don't think it's just 5%. It's, I, I think, certainly 6%. And, we, and China should and could definitely shoot for something even higher than that. And this is really important, actually, this year, because, you know, in many of the advanced economies, not doing well, you know, Federal Reserve increasing interest rates or... The interest rates are pretty high. We are, we are having financial problems in, in the banking sector. The advanced economies are not going to be a driver or a motor of growth this year. And this will impact even some large or medium-sized Asian economies, which are, which are dynamic exporters like South Korea, which exports a lot of its IT and electronic product to advanced markets, and they will not find a uh, find that sort of growth, export growth. And that's why it becomes that much more doubly important that China become that motor of consumption-led growth, which it can this year, because China is, of course, an export dynamo, but it is also becoming a consumption superpower, still distance to go. But the size of the economy, it's going to get to 20 trillion soon. And that itself creates ample space to suck in products not just from developed countries, but also from many of the BRI countries where China has made investments. Those investments have fired up the economic engine, and that economic engine can then export the goods back to China the way the United States used to be a motor for growth in, that, in, the, in, the, in a similar way 50 years ago. And that's why it's very important that China grow, grow fast this year. That will help its structural reform program going forward because that is best done in an environment of growth, and it can stabilize the world economy, which is going to have a difficulty, of particularly uh, many advanced economies and other also poorer economies which are suffering from debt distress. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Remy Pete, of course, we mentioned earlier that the Spanish prime minister was in attendance. He spoke as well. Let's listen to a little bit of what he had to say. China's modernization and Asia's growth have been beneficial for the whole world. Asia and Europe have prospered hand in hand for decades, and they can continue to do so now. Together, China and Europe account for a quarter of the world's population and around the half of the world's GDP. We share 
many common interests and challenges. Our economies are deeply interwined. So Emmy, talk to us about the potential there. Obviously, uh, Europe is not a homogenized place. I mean, Greece's relationship with China may be different than in other countries. But talk to us about the growth potential there. Well, you make a very good point, obviously, that, that the European Union is a variety of different countries with different foreign policies towards China. But all that is in common is that China is very important on the European agenda. The key word here is, is especially the word of reciprocity, which has been, you know, repeated from, you know, several months uh, ago to, to today, also by uh, uh, by the Prime Minister of Spain. But they, they, on this basis of reciprocity, the European Union and, and China have a lot to, to win by working together. And I think that, you know, there's been some some discussion on, on a wider scale and more on the on some key uh, policies that could be changing. Uh, you know, uh, discussions on 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 carbon uh, carbon tax at borders or you know decreasing the sanctions that were on specifically renewable energy technology uh, from from China to counter uh, the the Biden uh, you know uh, inflation reinvestment act and therefore strengthen the European uh, uh, renewable energy market by having more imports from China. That these are you know key policies that are moving forward. But more generally, there has to be a, a, a better, more sustained conversation. Traditionally, it was led by Angela Merkel a few years ago. Then Emmanuel Macron stepped in as as a key leader to talk to uh, to China. Uh, also sent. Uh, uh, Pedro Sanchez is also on, on the same vein, to be able to move forward on common fronts such as climate change mitigation, such as being able to mediate a you know, potential conflict. Uh, and, and definitely you know, the European Union fences itself kind of in between sometimes China and the United States in terms of being able to start with some ideas and some collaboration you know, bridges. And I think it could be a very good value for China also to seize that, that open hand continue working with the European leaders, understanding that key here is obviously the, the conflict in Ukraine, but also setting the stage of, you know, a fair reciprocal, you know, uh, world affairs uh, that could be multipolar, that could be some possibilities to discuss on that front. Hong Chin, uh, we just heard from Syrup talking about, you know, the tough economic landscape globally and China's importance uh, and Asia's as well in terms of trying to lift up uh, those numbers. Kristalina Georgieva uh, said 2023 is going to be another difficult year. The global economy is going to be dealing with the Russia-Ukraine conflict as well as uh, monetary tightening in some of these Western countries, as Sir Gupta alluded to. Um, she pointed out that Asia and China are going to play pivotal roles, uh, accounting for almost half of global trade. Let's listen to what she had to say. Our research shows that the long-term cost of trade fragmentation could be as high as 7% of global GDP, roughly equivalent to the combined annual output of Germany and Japan. Now, in Hainan, I know there's a lot of talk about globalization, uh, multilateralism. Do you see easing of protectionism? She's obviously talking about free trade and the importance of it. What do you see out there on the landscape today? So generally speaking, protectionism is still going on in, uh, in, uh, across the world, although we are trying to break it apart by having free trade zones, having uh, free trade agreements in the region. So for example, the CTPPP and uh, also the RCEP. So for these things, China actively trying to participate and trying to negotiate together with the, 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 the remaining countries. And uh, with those and with China being reopened up, that with the supply chain being reopened up and the capacity utilization picking up, we do think that the, uh, the results of export import will improve while still we need to balance together with the protectionism in different countries, especially in the West in, to some to, to certain degree. And additionally, going back to your earlier point around uh, global economic recovery, global economic growth for this year, Asia and China will play definitely a critical role. And in fact, the global GDP growth this year will again very much hinged upon China's recovery. And if the recovery is good, an additional 1% will mean a lot to the region, will mean a lot to the trading partners for China, and will, will mean a lot to the world. So as such, we are very optimistic to see that uh, good things will happen, while we need to be cautious about the risk about uh, protectionism still going on, including trade wars, including geopolitical conflicts. Uh, Hu Ya Wang, uh, the Chinese Premier Li Chung, stressing that China will never seek modernization through war, colonization, or plunder. Um, he's basically outlining China's view of what multilateralism looks like for the world audience. How would you describe it? 
Well, that's right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, China has actually uh, pursued a peaceful, <clears throat> peaceful uh, rise and, of course, also uh, uh, seek the uh, uh, cooperation with every country. I mean, China emphasizes, again, you know, mutual respect and, uh, and, uh, and no, uh, uh, you know, interference. So that, that, I think, is still the bottom line that China sticks to. And, uh, 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 but, of course, now the world is, uh, is, is, uh, is changing, evolving. We, we see the Britain Wood system is, needs to be in, in improved, enhanced. And China would like to play more active uh, uh, cooperative role there. And, uh, and given China's size and, and impact as a second largest economy, and also, you know, uh, uh, has a huge, uh, you know, biggest country for uh, 140 uh, country uh, as largest trading partner of China, uh, China certainly has a lot of uh, role to play. And China also recently been more active now in uh, mediating the peace process of, uh, of, uh, of other countries like Iran, uh, Saudi, but also in Ukraine and Russia, the, the war which is going on. So, so I think that uh, certainly, I think that this kind of, a, 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 you know, China's pursue economic globalization. China, you know, built up AIB and uh, launched the BRI and uh, joined this RCEP and uh, uh, also pursue CPTPP and DIPA and uh, with many other countries, African, Latin American, Central Asia. So China's pursue economic globalization still vigorously and strongly. But we are, unfortunately, we are seeing the world is campanized, as Premier Lee said. You know, we have uh, now uh, some countries actually pursue more uh, on, on the security, uh, uh, on, on the military globalization, which is not, not, not good. I think we are, 21st century, we are totally intertwined. We have to work together. We can't live without each other now. It's not a simple, it's not a binary world. You know, while ball form is going on, we still have this, uh, you know, the democracy, autocracy form. I, I think that is not helpful. I, I think that we really uh, need to work on the economic, work on the basic economic, you know, prosperity is, is the bad, you know, bad rock that has, you know, prevented us from third world war, prevented us from, you know, the world is, is collapsing. We have enjoyed over, 70 some years of peace and prosperity largely and let's continue that let's right. really pursue economic globalization so so i think that broad form symbolized china is probably a leading force now in pursuing you know, economic globalization and that's where we all the efforts should be you know we should not divide we should really work i mean like a, a spanish prime minister as your age account about 50 percent of global gdp with china china right. age account about 40 percent let's you know uh, bring more uh, <laughs> work together and, and improve the global economy. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. A great conversation. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us.